Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the February meeting of Central Park United Neighbors. March. Um, CPAN March. is registered. Sorry. March, Mr. March, March. You yeah, said March, February. March, March, March. We're, we're getting there, Carol. Uh, CPAN is the registered neighborhood organization for the Central Park community in Denver and Aurora. Uh, we're here to facilitate dialogue and create awareness around opportunities to engage on topics of importance to this community. Uh, we help people to find a way into a process so that resident questions, concerns, and ideas for a better community can be addressed in an inclusive and constructive way. Uh, we promote public service, civil civic discourse, and collective efficacy. Uh, at monthly meetings such as this one, uh, and through the work of our six working committees, CPUN facilitates the discussion of key issues with neighbors, engages in proactive problem avoidance, and amicable problem solving. CPUN is committed to providing an inclusive and welcoming environment for all members of our community. We are an all volunteer board of your neighbors and a registered 501c3. Our agenda tonight, the outreach meeting will um, begin with a review of our uh, DEI survey. You might recall if you joined us last month that uh, Mark Mariner presented the uh, key findings of a general community survey. Uh, board member Liz Stalnaker will do the same for a survey that was uh, issued last year and dedicated specifically to uh, matters of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we'll then move on to our regular community partner updates, followed by a, a special presentation by one of our regular community partners, uh, Mercy Housing. And then we'll conclude with a five minute uh, public comment period before moving on to our board meeting where we'll have uh, committee reports. We will continue um, our board's discussion and Mark, you can move on to the next slide um, of uh, the Unhoused Action Coalition and what CPUN's uh, uh, action plan for addressing um, that particular topic that of the unhoused in our community and across Denver will be. Um, we will then follow up with a uh, vote on whether or not CPUN should assume the responsibilities of the Citizens Advisory Board, um, followed by a uh, 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 more in-depth discussion amongst the board of the DEI survey and where we go with that information next. A brief treasurer's report, and then if, if we have some time left, we'll talk a little bit about uh, outreach for our, uh, I believe, six open board seats. Uh, we will quickly move on. Is Liz, Liz are you there? Yes, I am. Great. Um, yes, I can turn on my video for this part. Yeah, uh, Mark, do you we'll mind be sharing your screen, correct? Uh, Mark is sharing his screen. Okay. Mark, do you mind letting um, Liz uh, take over? Oh, um, so. Are you, are you allowed you, to do that? I, I can. Do you want me to share my screen with a slide deck then? Yeah. yeah. Are you allowed to um, just two seconds. Then. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had emailed them and thought I would do that. Um, Oh, uh, I sorry, I didn't see your email. Liz. I can. Do you want me to pull that up? That's just as easy. I, if if you're able to, our Wi-Fi was a little funky this afternoon, and so I thought just to be safe, it, if if you don't mind, um, kind of sharing and kind of advancing the, the slides. Is that if the that, uh, same? That is it the PDF version? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. Uh, one moment. Sorry, everyone. Thanks for yeah, your. Thank work. you. Sorry for the technical. No, it's. Um, well, I hope this presents okay. Uh, let me... We are almost there, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mark, you might have to do it. I've got a systems issue uh, that's not going to let me do that effective, uh, efficiently. Okay, I don't know if I have it, but I can. Yeah, let me okay. forward it to you. I'm, Send it to me. Okay, I will just do, uh, let me see if I can do, um, I've got my slide here. So um, if I'm a co-host, I can share my screen, right? Hopefully. I think that's correct. I believe so, give it a try. Okay, I'm clicking on now. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's gonna 
gonna take just a second and then we'll, we'll just fly through the slides once we got it. Um, okay, um, and unfortunately it's going to make me quit Zoom. <laughs> Was that your problem? Mark, do you, I've emailed you the slides um, just that. now. Yep, opening them, hold on. Yeah. Sorry about this. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Let's They're beautiful see. slides. <laughs> you won't be disappointed. <laughs> All those build up. Yeah. There we are. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Um, so this is just um, a slide presentation um, of the the 2021 DEI survey results from the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Uh, if you can advance to the overview, the next slide. Um, so a quick overview um, of this presentation. Um, we'll go over what CPUM's DEI committee is, what our mission statement is, who's on it, when do we meet. Um, the purpose of um, issuing the DEI survey last year, an overview of kind of what and when and how we did the survey, a summary of like, results, just kind of focusing on one aspect of the survey, um, and then further questions and next steps. Um, and if you can advance the slide, um, Mark, I'll let Shalise actually do the introduction to what CPUN's DEI committee is. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, our main focus for this survey was to get a picture of some of the diversity in the neighborhood. And we were just trying to gauge kind of a sense of how people felt in terms of a welcoming, welcoming inclusive community. And so our responses that we received from the survey gives you a broader idea of the feelings of discrimination and how welcome people feel when they come to this neighborhood. So what is the CPUN's DEI committee? We strive to inform, educate, and engage with residents of the Central Park community around equity and diversity issues affecting every community member. We advocate for and elevate all community voices by encouraging greater representation of and reducing disparate impacts to underrepresented groups within Central Park. We provide guidance and recommendations to the CPUN board to ensure all board actions are reflective of and informed by the diverse population and perspectives in our community. Next slide, please. What is CPUN's DEI committee? We have two committee chairs. That's myself, Shalise Hutley Harris, and Mandel Russo. Our committee meetings are the fourth Tuesday of every odd numbered month. So that would be January, March, May, July, September. We meet the fourth Tuesday at 6 p.m. Our next meeting day and time would be March 22nd at 6 p.m. The DEI committee also has an email list. So if you would like to receive news and updates between meetings, please log on or use the link to sign up for our emails. So thank you and I will let Liz take over and present to you the results. Okay. Um, so to start um, talking about the survey, I wanted to contextualize the survey within the DEI committee's goals last year. Um, and so we were kind of starting, kind of restarting after um, kind of a, a couple of years off. Um, and so um, we had, I think, a set, what felt like a set of modest goals at the time, um, and, and given, you know, the um, kind of newness of the committee and um, the fact that we're still in a pandemic. Um, so the first was just to establish committee leadership, so to choose the co-chairs um, and uh, establish a, a mission statement, which Shalise read, um, so checkbox there. We did that. Um, the second goal was actually to uh, work on the CPUN bylaw that did um, pass last uh, December um, to include Aurora, Aurora addresses within CPUN's footprint. Um, this was something that we identified because we actually had a, a former member of the um, DEI committee, Dion Williams, actually, uh, it was an Aurora resident of Central Park 
um, who had applied to be a board member for the CPON board and was um, ineligible because her address was outside of the footprint. So it seemed like a fairly uh, straightforward um, uh, way of increasing um, inclusivity in the neighborhood was to make sure that all residents were covered within the um, footprint in the bylaws. Um, so checkbox on that one. Um, the third one was the DEI community survey. Um, and then our fourth goal was to have some sort of outreach event to kind of identify neighbors who are interested in these issues and wanted to collaborate um, around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we actually had to scrap um, kind of a couple of different plans due to COVID numbers and concerns last fall. Um, but so I'm here just to talk specifically about the DEI community survey. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so the, what we, the kind of goal that we identified for like why send out this survey when there's already a community survey going out. And so, so um, within our committee, we wanted to provide a baseline level of data um, to help um, our committee identify the strengths and challenges related to diversity, equity, and inclusion in our community. Um, so we didn't want to just kind of go off on anecdotal information or kind of that we kind of knew because we're a pretty small group of people within a neighborhood of thousands of folks. So we wanted to at least um, engage more of our neighbors um, in these questions to help us understand um, what what we should be working on as a committee. Um, and so then the the kind of feeds into, um, we wanted some of the findings from the survey to help shape our 2022 goals, projects and events um, that we're going to be working on you know, for the rest of this calendar year. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so then uh, the overview of the DEI survey, um, it was sent out on SurveyMonkey and it was open between August 12th and September 12th of 2021. Um, there were 577 people who completed the survey during that period. There are actually several, I think, at least um, 100, if not more, people started the survey and did not complete it. Um, and I, so I think that's also just an interesting thing to note, um, because it was a very lengthy survey. Uh, it was, I think we ultimately had seven sections with a total of about 55 different questions. And they were a mix of multiple choice, scale ranking questions and free response. Um, and so I think just like the length and complexity of our questions were a, you know, a barrier to folks completing it. And we kind of realized that when we sent it out, but wanted to kind of not make the perfect the enemy of the good and kind of at least um, take our first stab uh, at this kind of a survey. Um, so the 577 uh, completed surveys uh, is a response of uh, basically represents 2% of our Central Park community. Um, and um, kind of another barrier was kind of the lack of in-person events and um, kind of limitations around um, being able to distribute it offline. So it was all electronic distribution through emails and Facebook posts uh, during that August to September period. Um, so the summary of results, so for tonight's purposes, because there's just a lot, it was a very long survey, there's a lot to dig into. We really just wanna focus on respondents' feelings of discrimination um, in order to gauge how welcome or included they feel in Central Park. So um, I wanna thank Amanda Allshaus actually is the one who kind of dug into um, the data set. Um, and so as an example of kind of different aspects of feelings of discrimination um, that were reported in the survey, about 1% of respondents have felt discriminated against based on disability. Um, about 1% of respondents have felt discriminated against due to their gender identity. 18% um, of respondents who identified as coming from non-US countries of origin, um, so that was a question trying to get at immigration status, or, or at least kind of immigration identity, um, have felt discriminated against. 8% of respondents who identify as Jewish have felt discriminated against um, because of their religion. 6% of respondents who identified as Christian have felt discriminated against um, because of their religion. And 1.3% of respondents who have no religious affiliation have felt discriminated against because of that um, lack of religious aff affiliation. Um, so that's kind of just an overview of um, di different parts of the survey we were looking at. Um, next slide, please. 
And so then the three um, kind of areas, like the next three slides, we'll look at uh, report, reported feelings of discrimination based on race and ethnicity. The next one will be sexual orientation and the next one will be socioeconomic status. Um, and so as you can see on the chart here, what we were looking at um, is comparing kind of the average um, of the, the community-wide average of responses um, that we received against um, responses we received from particular demographic groups. Um, and so, you know, because the overwhelming majority of people who responded to the survey were kind of white, straight, cis, um, uh, I think folks between the ages of 35 and 44. So it was a very kind of, uh, get kind of, you know, not, not necessarily, um, you know, a diverse sampling, but within um, the respondents, um, so it was about 11% was the community-wide um, feeling of uh, racial or ethnic discrimination that was reported in the full survey. And then within that 11%, um, 57% per, of people who were Black or Indigenous respondents um, reported uh, ra racial or ethnic discrimination. And just I just want to also say that we grouped um, Black or Indigenous re uh, respondents kind of together in this finding, just because there's, um, I don't know if you've heard the time, the term BIPOC refers to Black or Indigenous people of color, and it can be interpreted in a, two different ways, um, which are kind of opposites. One is um, Black or Indigenous people of color only from Black or Indigenous identified groups, or Black or Indigenous or other people of color. Um, and I think in, Amanda can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way she grouped it was that BIPOC meant um, only people identifying as Black or Indigenous uh, for this. Um, moving on, 33% of our Asian respondents, oh no, sorry, Asian respondents reported racial or ethnic discrimination, 18.2% of people of Hispanic ethnicity uh, reported the discrimination, and 15% of respondents who identify as other or unknown race, um, there was kind of a very long uh, set of uh, self-identifications folks could respond to. Um, also reported um, racial or ethnic discrimination. And the key takeaway is all non-white groups who responded to our survey reported racial or ethnic discrimination greater than the community average. Um, and then another interesting finding was 2% of respondents who identify as white reported discrimination based on race, which is substantially lower than all of the other race or ethnicity categories. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so then, um, the next area we wanted to look at was uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, the community-wide rate of sexual orientation discrimination is just 2%. So uh, that's the, the blue dotted line um, that is vertical um, so that you can see um, that within the queer community, the rate is 15%. Um, reported discrimination. And so that's much higher than the community-wide average. Um, and it also is much higher than 0% of discrimination among respondents who self-identify as heterosexual or who preferred not to report their sexual orientation. Um, next slide, please. And so then the, the kind of last category, uh, and there were a few others, but just for the purposes of tonight's uh, time limits, we wanted to look at socioeconomic uh, status. And the way that we looked at that was both um, level of education attained um, and um, current household income. Um, and so the community-wide rate of socioeconomic discrimination was 5.5%. Um, and um, kind of when you look at the horizontal bars going across that vertical uh, dotted line, um, you have higher rates of socioeconomic discrimination being reported among respondents with um, who've attained um, less than college education uh, who re or who report incomes below $100,000 per year or who preferred not to report either of those categories. Next slide, please. Um, and so again, this is just a, kind of a, a very basic look at one aspect of the survey, um, but I think that we have our further questions and next steps. Um, we really want to have uh, the topic for our upcoming DEI committee meeting next week, and then in conversations going forward, we want to talk about how can the survey results um, 
that we're looking at inform um, our committee goals and projects for 2022. Um, we're interested in looking at how um, how 2020 US census data about the Central Park uh, zip codes um, or statistical neighborhoods um, can kind of in kind of inform some of the results or supplement or complement uh, the results from our survey um, so that we can understand just kind of the demographic um, information about Central Park residents um, in, you know, within Central Park in comparison to our adjacent zip codes or statistical neighborhoods and in comparison to Denver as a whole. Um, and then there's also another piece of our survey. Uh, there were kind of several kind of qualitative responses in the open-ended questions um, that we want to kind of dig into deeper and just haven't, up to be perfectly honest, have not had a chance to really uh, dive into that as much, but we just kind of have a, a lot of that sitting out there. Um, I think for the our purposes of this survey, since it was the first one we had done, and I this is not what I do professionally. This is not my personal background, and we're lucky to have you know expertise on the CPUN board and within the committee uh, working on it. But I think that we've identified that um, any other kind of DEI-focused survey we send out needs to be more accessible uh, to more people. Um, so it should be shorter um, with a more focused set of survey questions. Um, we need to simplify the language um, so that the questions are not as complex uh, to respond to. Um, and something we had identified even before we sent it out is that we really should translate it into Spanish and any other um, kind of major languages uh, other than English and Spanish identified within Central Park. Um, and then also to have a greater outreach effort, um, particularly trying to reach people offline, um, either tabling at events, um, if there are you know, kind of public events that the MCA is having on that coincide with sending out a survey or having some door knocking within um, different neighborhoods that we want to do outreach to. Um, and so that's uh, kind of some, of some of our takeaways that we're going to be bringing to our future DEI committee meetings. Next slide, please. Um, and I know we'll be discussing this kind of uh, a little bit more during the board hour, but if anybody has questions, comments, or suggestions for us, you can also email us at DEI committee at centralparkunitedneighbors.com. And I want to thank um, just Brooke Lee uh, and Tripti Sutar are the ones who worked on um, getting the survey into SurveyMonkey in the first place, and it was not an easy task. Um, thank all of our survey respondents and then um, Amanda Allshaus for doing kind of the, the data crunching um, that we were able to present tonight. Um, and so that's, that's the end of the survey. Happy to, I guess, open up for any questions or comments if there's time. There is time. Does anyone have any questions for Liz or the DEI committee? Is there anything that surprised you about the responses that you received overall? Um, I, I feel like I should uh, ask some of the other. Um, sure. I, as, as some of the other folks on the DEI committee, but I mean, personally looking at that, it was, it was, you know, it's, these are very small, it was, it's a very small sample of the community. So it's kind of hard to, um, I feel like it's hard to say anything like too specific, but I feel like the, um, I guess, kind of the, the disproportionate feelings of um, discrimination or a lack of inclusiveness within different kind of minority groups within the community, um, seeing that represented within the results, it, was was actually interesting and and kind of validating to kind of what I guess the qualitative feedback we've received from different folks in the community, um, but but it also doesn't you know again like these are really small samples with it because it's you know a certain percentage of folks within you know that was already a small percentage of folks who responded overall. Mm -hmm. Liz, I appreciate what you just said about sample size, as well as the fact that um, you're still digging into the data. Um, but is there, I wonder if there's an opportunity with um, perhaps past uh, CPUN surveys to, to look at movement. It might not be apples to apples exactly, but has the community gotten better in this regard or in any regard really? over the last two years or 10 years. Um, is that the sort of thing that um, you hope to look at as well? Yeah, 
I think so. And I think that's why we wanted to get out the survey last year to have some kind of a baseline and also just figure out, because we didn't know what we didn't yeah, know sure. and figure out. Um, but what we would like to do, either um, having a DEI focused kind of standalone survey or making it a part of the community survey um, so that we can get year over year data um, mm -hmm. on, on these topics. Do um, any other attendees have a question? Liz, that was a really impressive presentation. Uh, thank you for that. I also really wanna thank um, Brooke and Trupti and Shalice. Um, they are not CPUN board members, they're uh, dedicated uh, community members who, um, who give of their time uh, to work on something that's important. Uh, in our community. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the time that you three put into to making this happen, as well as the, the entire DEI committee. Um, that was fantastic, Liz. Thank you very much. Brooke has something to say, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Sorry. Go ahead, Brooke. I don't know. I don't know, Sam. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. Um, oh. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, there's just one thing. And I, you know, I hesitate to even bring it up, but the most shocking thing about this experience to me, and maybe this is um, my own naivete, but I was surprised at the negative um, responses we got that were um, kind of attacking the DEI committee for even doing the survey. Um, yeah, that's the, the open-ended qualitative responses that we need to dig into. But there were, yeah, there, there were um, several responses that were kind of attacking the idea of sending out a survey of this kind or having a committee of this nature uh, on CPUN. Could you say a little bit more about that? I find that disturbing. <laughs> yeah, Liz, could you um, I, I mean, I'm happy to, I, I mean, I, I feel like we need, it was, you know, just, I, with any survey, I think we, we add like, is there anything else you think we should know? Um, and, and so some folks like, so it's just an open-ended response to, see you know what 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 folks would like to communicate and and some folks i mean out of 577 responses i would say that it's probably fewer than 20 were um of that kind but it was people who intentionally took the survey completed it um and and provided those responses i thought was interesting i i don't know if i i guess like i it doesn't shock me um but i I do find it interesting, but I don't think I have anything definitive to say one way or the other, because we also got several responses that were like, I'm so glad somebody's sending out a survey about this. Um, so I, I, I think we, that, that's one of the things that we do need to dig into deeper. It's just kind of an interesting, I, I, I think an interesting point is that there, there definitely were negative responses. Yeah, if I could add a little context to that, uh, I, I've done a lot of research throughout the country and it's it's almost all you know politically focused, but some of it's not necessarily explicitly political. And um, the language that different ideological communities use is so different at times that using the word diversity or inclusion uh, automatically respond you know prompts those kinds of responses among some folks. And you know we're a growing and ideologically diverse community, so it's uh, you know one of the realities of the political world that we live in right now. Not to have a sad tone, but you know, <laughs> hopefully we uh, find a way to reunite. Well, thank you um, again to the DEI committee. Thank you to Brooke uh, for, for raising that point. Um, and uh, unless there's any other comments, I'd like to move on to our community uh, partners. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, we're back to our, our slide deck and we'll start with the uh, Denver Police Department. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Hines. I'm uh, the Sector 1 Lieutenant in District 5, which uh, basically means I cover all of Precinct 5, 11, and 512, which also uh, basically follows all the boundaries of the Central Park neighborhood in Denver. Um, I'm joined on the call tonight by Danae Ferenz, who is our uh, community resource officer for this section of District 5 as well. Just to give an update on things we have going on out in the neighborhood, 
Uh, we have had a rash of uh, theft from motor vehicles and uh, and uh, I would call them, they were classifying them as criminal mischief to vehicles, but we believe that some of these cases have been incidents where people have broken the window to vehicles with the attempt to steal something and haven't found anything to steal in the vehicle. So we had a large rash of those in the south end of precinct 512 uh, over the last two months. Uh, to give you an idea geographically, we're kind of talking about um, mostly along like the Roslyn and Syracuse Street corridors south of MLK and then uh, out eastwards uh, kind of following about Montview to the edge of the district. So um, that is a problem that we're aware of and we've been putting a lot of resources into trying to locate the individuals that were responsible for those crimes. I will say that we've seen a drastic decrease in those crimes in the last week. So we're not sure if some of the individuals we arrested on our operations turned out to be these guys and we couldn't prove they were the ones or if they got scared away because of some operations we were running out there. But either way, we have been seeing a decrease in those crimes, but it is uh, something I've been asked about repeatedly and I wanted to address here um, just so everybody's aware that we're, uh, we're making efforts to do that. We've run uh, probably no less than seven operations using our undercover teams plus uh, nightly operations uh, using our, our normal uniformed uh, detail personnel. Uh, aside from that, a crime concern I wanted to bring up just because we're starting to head into spring is my uh, usual reminder to be mindful of your garage doors. Uh, we have seen a decrease in uh, garage burglaries in the last year, and I attribute that to uh, people being uh, better about shutting their garage doors, but that is always a source of a lot of our burglaries in the neighborhood, and we don't want to uh, draw criminals into your neighborhood uh, because they, uh, they see it as an easy target. So it's a simple thing you can do, shut your garage and make sure your neighbors are shutting their garages and it'll keep people from coming in and stealing your bikes or your tools or anything else they might find in your garage. Um, I think uh, Danae can give an update on some of the things that we have uh, coming up and then uh, we can take any questions you might have as well. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see some of you um, from earlier today. Um, the only update I have, um, again, is the commander's meeting. It's this Thursday at 6 p.m. It is virtual um, via Microsoft Teams. Um, I will put that link in the chat for anybody who is interested. We also have a new commander, so Commander Penn will be presenting the crime stats and um, crime trends of all of District 5, and he'll be answering any questions anybody may have. And that's all I have right now. Uh, any questions? Um, one, uh, Lieutenant Hines, we had a frustrated resident reach out um, earlier today, uh, frustrated about uh, crime in the neighborhood, not non-violent crime, but um, thefts and and that sort of thing. And and I think and one of the point questions they raised was neighborhood watch. And a couple of years ago, uh, the police department essentially took over neighborhood watch at its at your request. And I wonder if um, either tonight, if you're prepared to speak to where that stands and what activities are are ongoing, or perhaps at the next meeting, if if that might be something we could. Um, uh, put back in front of the community. So uh, Neighborhood Watch is still in place. Uh, that's always yes. been a, a police department program we've had since uh, back in the 70s. Yeah. Um, Officer Ferenz uh, may be able to uh, give some guidance because she actually uh, helps run our Neighborhood Watch here in District 5. Yeah. Get some details on that. Sure, I'd be happy to speak on that. So it's something that um, I've been in this position for about two years. So it's something we have kept going through email. So if anybody is on my email list, um, then you would see those updates. We do do them on opposite months of the commander's meetings. So the commander meetings are always on the odd month. So we do it on even months, um, usually at the beginning of the month. I'll let people know. Um, I will say attendance probably since COVID has really died down significantly. Um, so what we're going to start doing moving forward is doing the meetings on a RSVP
basis um, because the last few times we've held held meetings, we've had maybe two or three people. Um, so we really want to encourage that attendance again. So maybe it had something to do with COVID and everybody staying home and, and things like that, but they have continued. Um, we will continue to do the meetings and we, I, I like to bring different resources. Like previously I've had animal control at one of the meetings discussing issues around um, like dog leashes and different um, concerns that I was getting at the time from the community about animals and things like that. So I try to bring guest speakers. Um, they have been virtual and we will look into doing them in person again or doing like a mixture of both to make it easy on everybody. Um, but yeah, trying to get that attendance back up is something that I would really like to work on post COVID. Okay. So, and I might just add to that too, that, uh, you know, if anybody's curious about Neighborhood Watch, please reach out to us and, uh, and get your name on the list. We're not asking for a time commitment. We're not, we get a lot of questions, you know, are we expected to go out and patrol and our answer is absolutely not. Um, you know, we just want to have uh, have a greater uh, communication partnership between us and the community in a way to a way that we can share uh, information about crime that's taking place and also uh, hear from the community on issues that you guys are seeing out there. So um, anybody who's thinking about it, please reach out and we'll, we'll add you to our list and uh, can attend some of the meetings that uh, our CROs are putting on and uh, help us uh, reduce some of these quality of life issues in the neighborhood. Yeah, Thanks. and the best way to hear about some of this information is by just contacting me so I can add you to my email list. Um, another platform I use is the Nextdoor app. So if anybody has Nextdoor, I'm constantly posting different like safety flyers on there, or most recently on Monday, I posted the commanders meeting on there. So that's a platform to look for my updates, but just simply shooting me an email, I'll make sure you get those updates. Um, I don't send emails every week and I'm not, you know, sending a bunch of scams and things like that. You'll maybe see an email from me once every three to four weeks with all the updates, crime stats, um, and upcoming events and upcoming meetings and things like that. So um, shoot me an email if you are interested and I will put that in the chat as well. Great. And I just want to say real quick, cause I received yeah. something in the chat here and this is worth bringing up uh, a good reminder that a lot of the crimes uh, we keep hearing from people that they're being reported in neighborhood Facebook groups. I want to just remind everybody, it, it probably seems obvious, but um, reporting a crime in Facebook group and reporting it to the police, is very different things. Please call us if you're aware of a crime that's happened to you or um, encourage your neighbors to call us if a crime happens. If we don't know these crimes are happening, we can't direct our resources to where they're happening and get ahead of these patterns. So that's just something I wanted to, uh, that's just something I wanted to remind everyone of uh, since I just received that message in the chat. Thank you, Lieutenant Hines and Officer Friends. Appreciate it. Any other questions for them before we move on? I've got a question as it relates to traffic safety. The intersection at MLK Boulevard and Central Park, there seems to be a number of crashes at that intersection. I'm just wondering if you have any data as to what might be causing this. I'm, uh, I also noticed that sometimes during the, you know, different times of the day, those traffic lights are hard to see. So I'm wondering if there might be something related to that. You know, offhand, I'm not sure on that. Uh, a lot of that data for uh, intersection related crashes across the city is compiled by our traffic investigations unit and traffic units rather in the district level um, to try to look at areas where there might be problem intersections. Um, I know we get a fair number of accidents at that intersection. Uh, without digging into the data further, I can't accurately tell you whether or not it's a higher incidence of accidents at that intersection versus uh, ac accidents at intersections with a comparable volume of traffic. Um, in terms of lighting and things like that, uh, that's a concern I can bring over to uh, um, traffic engineering and see if they can look at that. That would be something that they would uh, ultimately have authority over rather than the police department. But if we're seeing problems out there, we definitely want to let them know about it um, 
So that's uh, that's something I can look into. Unfortunately, I can't tell you that I have uh, good data to uh, give you an accurate answer on that right offhand. Fair enough. Thank you. Thanks, Mandel. Um, I just, we... I'd, I'd oh, like I'm to. Sorry, share... That's fine. Um, I was going to mention this in the Safe Streets Committee meeting, but very briefly, Westward just did a story today about accidents in the city in the 78 neighborhoods and Central Park rates the highest in terms of accidents from January 1 to March 11. And so I can get that link in um, as far as the article that Westward just published. We had 14 and five of them are hit and runs. So and in some neighborhoods there are none. Uh, I think in 11 different neighborhoods there were none, but they have a listing. It's a it's a pretty comprehensive article and it also um, lists where they got their data. Thanks. Oh, Mark's already on it. He's got the, got the link in the chat. Um, I'm a little sensitive to time, so I do want to move on if we can. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Denver Police Department, for joining us. Uh, Amanda Schultz from Councilman, Councilman Herndon's office. Do you want to go next? Thank you. Sure, and I'll be brief. Um, I don't have a ton. Um, uh, first, my apologies for being a little more casual than normal. I was outside trying to soak up some of that sunshine, and I hope a few of you had a chance to do a little bit of the same. Um, just one quick announcement from our end, and that is Northeast Denver Leadership Week. If you know a high school student who would be interested in a free week-long um, leadership development and career exploration program, please send them our way. We are still taking applications through March 24th and we would love to have them. And I'll stick around until the end of the meeting as well. So if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to send them my way. Thanks, Amanda. Any questions for Amanda? Uh, is there a link, Amanda, that you can share in the chat? Yes, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, the We don't have Northeast Transportation Connections or the library joining us tonight, so uh, we'll move on to the MCA. I see Diane uh, joined us. Do you want to say anything, Diane, or is Jack going to represent the MCA? Well, I'll, I'll start out. Okay, um, great, thanks. <laughs> and then, Jack, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Um, no, it's all you, Dieter. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, also, I just want to let everyone know that uh, Shalice is now our MCA board president. So congratulations to Shalice. We are very excited to have her um, starting out and running with the uh, board at the MCA. So um, also, we've got our uh, rehires going on right now for all of our pools. We will be looking to hire 165 plus additional staff for the uh, summer. And we will begin the new hire process once we kind of get a feel for the hires that are coming back. Um, but we will be starting that in April. So we do um, provide training for lifeguards. And we would love to have just as many participants as possible. And we do have on our website, mca80238.com, we have our application for those positions. We have just, re we have just hired two, one, both actually are community members, two people for our events. So they will be full-time staff from the community for our events. And then we'll be hiring some summer staff for that um, for our events as well. We have um, an exciting morning because we opened up for the first time the cube space, and we had uh, the Central Park Business Association meet for the first time in two years in our cube space. And that's really exciting. And we look forward to hosting CPUN down the road um, once you all are up and ready to go in person. Uh, we're opening up the cube for um, April 1st for rentals. And we will begin that process. We're already receiving requests and we will um, be following up with all of those requests and filling up our calendar with uh, rentals in the cube space. The um, 
The other thing, we are uh, going to a full event calendar. So all of our events should be up and running as normal. It sounds like our farmer's market is going to have over 60 vendors this year, which is up from our typical 50. So people are very excited to get up and get going again. And uh, I think that is pretty close to about it. It's a lot, Diane. <laughs> Glad to know that you'll be uh, up and running full speed this year. Um, Sarah. Oh, uh, hold on, um, Jeff. Diane, are we still going to have the hybrid meeting tomorrow for the MCA delegate we, meeting? We do. Our delegate meeting is hybrid. So if you are so inclined and want to attend in person, it is at the Cube at noon. The Cube address is 8371 East Northfield Boulevard. So we're right across from Macy's basically, just north of Macy's. And then um, it's also via Zoom and you can go onto our website and um, maybe I can get you the Zoom link in the chat if you want to do it via Zoom. Thank you. You bet. Sarah, I see your hands raised. Do you have a question for Diane? Yeah, real quick. What's the youngest age that you'll accept for a lifeguard? For a lifeguard is pretty 16. If they're turning 16 in the summer, they can come in and get trained and be ready to go. So we do have a junior lifeguard program. Um, so if they want to be a junior lifeguard and they're 14, we do provide that training as well. And does the junior lifeguard, because I've got a lot of like that young teen um age kiddos in the complex in the um in the bluff lake apartments and a lot of those uh -huh. kids are really itching they're like miss miss i want a job and i'm like guys you got to go to school but um for summer um and then would they get paid if they're a junior lifeguard they 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 do they, they don't get paid outright until they can oversee they're to the point of being able to oversee lessons so we okay. will have them on the deck to lifeguard lessons. So they do get paid when they're able to do that. Super. All right. Oh, and I saw Ms. Amanda said about the jump park. And yeah, I've already got one kid working over there at the jump park. So I was just trying to find some other options as well. But thank you for that that quick well, note as well. You know what? Let us um, let us know if you feel like they are a mature 14 year old, we could maybe have them help us with events because we tear down concerts and things like that. So we need people, we need young people with lots of energy. <laughs> oh yes, yes, so I, I have plenty of those. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, yeah, you thank you, Diane. Um, do we have anyone from the foundation uh, here with us this evening? I don't think, I didn't, I don't think I saw anyone. If not, um, I will turn it over to Sarah's colleagues at Mercy Housing uh, Ellen and Aaron, we're, we're glad to have you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I am going to, am I able to share a screen and have a PowerPoint that we'd like to share with you all? So? Looks like I can't. Working on giving you the ability. Hold on a second. Okay. Is it showing? Yep, yeah, it's working. Great. Oh, perfect. Yes. <laughs> um, well, thank goodness, Erin, because I need the words. I need the prompts on this PowerPoint <laughs> so I know what I'm supposed to say. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm Ellen Abrams. I um, am, am the philanthropy director at Mercy Housing. And you've already met Sarah. She's one of our resident services coordinators at Bluff Lake Apartments. And then Erin is a support coordinator. Um, we work together in the philanthropy department. So thank you so much for having us. I know you all have heard about Mercy Housing. I know Sarah, I myself, Erin, um, sometimes other um, people from Mercy have been in your board meetings and community meetings. Um, and many of you have been super helpful uh, supporting our two communities up in Central Park, Bluff Lake, and Park, Parkside Apartments. But 
there's many of you who really don't know the breadth and scope of the work that Mercy Housing does. And part of our job is to help spread that word. So I wanted to thank you both for your support. Thank you all for your support and for allowing us this opportunity. We don't have a ton of time. Um, we're hoping that we could get through our little presentation quickly enough so that if you have any questions, we can field them. If you wanna put them in the chat, we can um, address them at the end. Um, and with that, uh, that's my little opener. And I just will start by saying, um, for anyone who doesn't know Mercy Housing or know a lot about Mercy Housing, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. So we've been around for a long time and our corporate office is actually here in Denver, in downtown Denver. Um, and we do have quite a presence in Colorado in, and in the Metro Denver area, not just the two communities up in Central Park. And you'll hear, we'll talk more about that. But um, we're an affordable housing, housing provider, the largest in the country. And I'm sure you've all heard about the term affordable housing and it seems like such a hot topic and we know it's a crisis. Why is it a crisis? What's happening now? Um, in 2022, besides the fact that we just came, are coming out of the pandemic, which certainly didn't help anything. Um, there's lots of reasons. I don't have enough time to um, really drill down into any one of them, but just quickly, we all know housing prices are skyrocketing. Um, you may not know it, but there actually is a national housing deficit and within that deficit, there's also not enough affordable housing being built. And on top of it, and partly because of the pandemic, but not only because of the pandemic, there's an increase in homelessness. So it's really quite a big problem, not just in Colorado, but everywhere. Um, Colorado does not, um, does not come out well on the charts for caring and having affordable housing. So, just to give you an idea from an individual perspective here in Colorado, um, and I hate to throw numbers at you, but it kind of does help paint the picture. There's about 162,000 extremely low income households living across Colorado with only about 48, 49,000 affordable units available. What makes it affordable? How is that determined? Well, the federal government and the Colorado Department of Housing say that a renter who pays more than 30% of their income for their housing, they're considered cost burdened. Um, these are the people who are making a decision between having a roof over their head or maybe seeing a doctor or maybe eating a meal. Um, and these, um, many are the residents that we serve at Mercy Housing. Um, the Colorado minimum wage is actually a little bit higher than 12.32, that's a little bit, it, but it's lower than $13 an hour. And the minimum wage, a minimum wage earner would need to work 72 hours a week to afford a modest two bedroom apartment. So it paints a grim picture. Erin, can you go to the next slide, please? Did it show? I just. Your freeze, um, is your screen freezing? I can open mine. No, it's, it, I, it looks like oh, it's no, working. No. Okay. okay, yes, sorry. So enter Mercy Housing, yay us. Um, what are we doing out there? So nationally speaking, because we're a national organization, we have 343 affordable apartment communities in about 22 states, serving um, about 44,000 residents. The average length of stay in one of our apartments is six and a half years. And the average resident household income is $10,132. Um, for every extremely low income household in Colorado, there are only 30 rental units available. Just another figure. So who do we serve? We serve 
all kinds of people, veterans, families, children, people with disabilities, seniors. Um, we run the whole gamut. And every Mercy Housing community is different. We have some that are just senior properties. We have some that are just family properties. We have um, properties that cater to people with disabilities, people who are very vulnerable, populations, we call that supportive housing, many of them formerly homeless. So we really try um, through our resident services programming, which Erin will talk about later, serve all these different types of people in all different ways, depending on the property that, that they live in. Thanks, Ellen. Um, I'm glad we had an opportunity to highlight the residents that we serve because they really are the core of, of what we do here at Mercy Housing. So to bring it a little closer to home, um, Mercy Housing Mountain Plains is the region that we're in. It consists of six different states that spans across the Midwest, the Southwest, and includes us here in Colorado. Um, here in Colorado, we serve about 3,000 individuals and families in 17 different communities across the Front Range also in Durango, Fort Collins, and we have a property in Utah as well that's um, part of our Colorado region. And those properties, as Ellen mentioned, range from family, senior to supportive properties. So here's another look at some of that same information, but kind of highlighting um, the state. You can see that we have a high impact here in Denver with the majority of our um, properties located in the Denver metro area. We have like three down in Durango, one up in Fort Collins. So let's talk about something that you all might be interested, which is our Central Park neighbors. The apartment buildings of uh, Bluff Lake and Parkside, which are both family properties in the Central Park neighborhood. They serve over 350 residents and around 125 youth. And these, are, these residents are part of our community here. Um, they may work in your grocery store, work in your school. Their kids go to school um, here in the neighborhood. And so we are just really thankful to have your continued support um, to provide them um, resources. So what sets Mercy Housing apart from other affordable housing providers? Well, it's really our resident services programming, which is providing more than four walls and a roof to residents. It's meeting people where they're at and helping them to achieve any goals that they've set for themselves. Um, and the resident services programming or resident services is really uh, the focus of Ellen and I's uh, philanthropy and the fundraising that we do. So what are resident services? Um, they're free on-site programs um, and services for all residents. And we focus our area in five high impact areas that includes health and wellness, out of school time, financial education, housing stability, and community engagement. Here is a very short list of some of the resident services that are available at our properties. Um, out of school time, I just wanted to highlight because it's one of our largest programs available at our family properties and has a ton of engagement. And basically what it does is it provides youth a place to go after school, a safe place, a fun place, where they can um, get science and literacy help. They do educational field trips. There's always healthy snacks that are provided. There's homework club, which is really fun. They do crafts and games, but there's also an opportunity for leadership development as well. So it's really, um, and not only is the, are these services offered um, free of charge again to families, during the school year, but there's also out of school time programming throughout the summer months as well. So it really helps give folks, parents and families peace of mind that kids have a safe, fun place to go. And we 
kind of have a saying that if you've seen one Mercy housing property, you've only seen one Mercy housing property because um, basically the resident services programming, programming is customized for each a particular property. So um, for example, at a senior proper we, property, there would be different programs and services available to that particular demographic versus a family property. So um, really the resident services staff like Sarah, who you know, can customize the, the resources that we provide to the needs of the residents. And so now I'd like to introduce you to Izzy. Izzy is one of our cute little youth residents. She actually lives in Omaha, Nebraska, but her story and her perspective about um, out of school time, otherwise known as OST, I think really spans throughout many of the family properties. So this is a short video that I hope you enjoy. You should and your friends should know about this place because it is one of the homiest, loving, caring, respectfulest, clean place that I would ever know. And you get to do a, a lot of fun things and you just feel like you're home. My name is Izzy and I live in Crestview Village in Nebraska. My favorite thing about my house is my bedroom and the kitchen and living room. My bedroom makes me feel safe and cozy, and then I get a lot of sleep in the kitchen. My favorite is where you get food. I go to homework club, I go to Girl Scout, and team time. Team time is where you're going into fifth grade. You do these older kid activities like science and you get a um play trivia and just have a lot of fun with older kids and get to know each other and i also go to the summer program i forgot about that you can go there and they serve you lunch and they're my favorite lunches <laughs> We get to do things in the garden, and we went to the zoo for a field trip before school started, and it was really fun. We have a great community. I want to work at Mercy Housing. They help a lot of people that need help in the future. Izzy, she's really cute. Thank you, Erin. Um, so aside from the resident services program, you're probably all saying, well, why isn't there more affordable housing? Why aren't we doing that? Well, we are, we are, we are. For the first time in 12 years, our region is has a new affordable housing community going up. It's called the Rose on Colfax. Um, it's on East Colfax at Valencia Street. The name was chosen by um, two Colfax neighborhood associations. We did a whole um, survey and that was the name selected. The idea, um, it came from a Tupac poem um, about a rose being able to grow out of concrete. And um, it really resonated with uh, the people who live in that neighborhood as well as the people who were working on um, building this new, very cool community. And what makes it so cool and innovative is that not only does it have 82 affordable apartments for families um, and a courtyard and community rooms and ground floor parking and all of that great stuff, and it's on the bus line, but it also has a 5,600 square foot early childhood education center on the ground floor that is um, open to the residents that live in the building, but also people who live in that neighborhood, which happens to be a childcare desert. So um, the community is very excited to have that opportunity. We partnered with Mile High Early Learning, a very um, well-known Montessori-based education um, provider. And, um, 
We also partnered um, and got a lot of support with Mile High United Way, and um, they will be taking the name of the Early Childhood Center, I'm proud and happy to say. And we are having a groundbreaking actually, April 7th, construction has already begun. So if you're ever driving by that area, you can um, go right by it. And if you happen to be around on April 7th at 11 o'clock, we've got a full lineup. The mayor is coming, um, the head of housing stability, Britta Fisher is joining us, the CEO of Mile High Learning and also Mile High United Way, several people from Mercy Housing. We've got a whole big um, program set. So if you'd like to come, we will share the invitation with Jeff and um, maybe we could get it up in the chat. So that's happening. We're also working on expanding up in Fort Collins and very actively pursuing um, a couple of places in the Phoenix area. Um, so it's starting and we couldn't be more excited and we couldn't feel more support from pretty much anyone that we talk to, right? because I think the sentiment is we really need it. And while we need the new housing, I wanna also just say that it's also very important to preserve existing housing. And um, we do that on a daily basis by, um, we've got two huge renovations going on right now in Denver um, where uh, apartments are getting completely upgraded and redone at no cost to the person living there, um, except that they have to uh, be displaced for a short while while that happens. But it's important to keep our footprint and to grow our footprint. So with that, uh, you're probably all wondering or not surprised to see the slide that says, how can you get involved? Um, there's lots of different ways um, we offer a ton of volunteer opportunities. I think you um, have, if you've been on more of these calls or reading stuff from um, CPUN, you've heard about donation drives and volunteer opportunities virtual. Now we're back in person, so we um, welcome your support. Um, if you have an expertise you'd like to share, we would love to talk with you about it. If you would like to be a sponsor at an event, host a donation drive. If you or your organization that you work for would like to adopt a property and really get to know it and provide help for all year round, we would love to talk to you. So there's a lot of different ways to help and um, we can really use it. So, so please be in touch and um, we'll put our uh, emails up. And then of course, through Jeff, we can circulate that. And I just wanted to chime in and, and kind of give a shout out to all the folks who have already participated in our donation drives that we pretty much run throughout the year. Um, we have that time set up, designated time at Bluff Lake Apartments, the second Thursday of every month, where folks can drop off um, personal hygiene items, cleaning products, uh, things of that nature. And I know Sarah keeps our Mercy Housing Amazon wish list pretty much up to date with any current needs. And we've just we've seen a lot of outpouring of support from the Central Park neighborhood. So thank you, thank you for everyone who um, kind of has has donated in, in whatever capacity. And we had a really great response also. I, this is the first time I'm seeing you all since the holidays, but the holidays were um, amazing. So we appreciate everyone in the community who kind of spread the word about our holiday drive because we just had an enormous outpouring of support um, for the youth. And it was re just really, really heartwarming. So thank you so much. And one last plug for um, some volunteer opportunities. This, uh, the first week of May, May 2nd through the 6th, is going to be our annual Mercy Housing Colorado Volunteer Week. And we'll have um, lots of different uh, activities set up at properties throughout the Denver metro area. It could be um, helping organize a food pantry or working with youth, doing crafts, uh, hosting a round of bingo for seniors. So there's a wide variety of different things that you can do during that, that volunteer week. Um, and communication about that and save the dates will be going out shortly. So 
um, keep an eye out for that information. We'd love to have you visit one of our Mercy Housing properties and, and get involved. And I'd just like to, I think we have a few minutes, hopefully Jeff, to take a few questions. If there's any additional information we can share with you, we would um, love to take a minute to do that. Sure, I do see Gina's hands up. Gina, do you wanna uh, share something? Uh, yes, I was wondering if your new property, uh, Rose on Colfax, how many three bedroom units do you have or will you have? I, wait, Regina, are you a resident of Bluff Lake? I know you. Yes, I yes, used to be a resident right. there. Yes, how are you? Okay. <laughs> um, you know what? I don't know that off the top of my head, but I can find out and let you know. I don't, I don't remember how they break out in that building. But you can, um, Regina, the roseoncolfax.org is um, the website for that property in particular and you can um if that information's not that specific information's not on that website you can put a query in on the website and, and someone will return that and get back to you okay thank you yes of course that was a fantastic uh presentation ellen and aaron and thank you for sharing uh, a lot of really uh, interesting and valuable information as well as those great volunteer opportunities. If you send that stuff my way, we'll we'll make sure to get it distributed. Every, every time I had a question, it was it was what was on the next slide. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, well good. thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for having us and we hope to see you all. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any uh, last questions for uh, Mercy Housing? All right. Well, thank you very much, Ellen and Aaron. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we do have a public comment period uh, next before our board meeting starts. I'll ask our board meetings, and of course, open to anyone that wishes to sit in. Um, I'll, we're running a bit behind schedule, so I'll ask the board to just kind of stay on rather than taking our typical break. Uh, we'll start the public comment period. Uh, is there anyone with that would like to make a comment? before we carry on with the board meeting. Okay. All right, we'll get on to our board meeting then. Thank you everybody. Again, you're welcome to stay. Hi everybody, sorry, we're a little bit uh, behind schedule. Um, all for good reasons though. I thought that was a really nice outreach hour. I enjoyed um, all of our presentations tonight. Um, why don't we start with um, committee updates and if we can be brief here just because we do have some uh, time sensitive stuff to get to uh, as a board. Uh, why don't we start with communication and outreach committee. I'll briefly comment on that. I uh, joined CPBA yesterday to talk about the welcome bags project that um, our, our committee has been working on for the past few months. Um, the plan for it now is for uh, CPUN to produce that um, oversized postcard sort of collateral piece that Mandel uh, designed for us. That will go in a CPBA bag, and we will um, lead the distribution of those uh, bags as soon as our card is in those and ready to go. Um, uh, we typically will do 50-ish a month. Um, that's the goal with the specific focus on the areas that um, our board has identified as being um, of interest, that being the North End and um, some of the renters and some of the other audiences that uh, Liz described in, in her presentation. Um, once we have uh, our own CPUN bags or once we sort out the bags um, on our end, we might do a, a sort of a hybrid co-branded bag uh, with the CPBA to continue um, that initiative uh, with the co-branded bag and we'll have dedicated CPUN bags for events and other things that we're, that we're looking to do. Um, Jeff uh, Ederer, uh, as president of CPBA, would you add anything to that? Um, not really other than um, I think this is great that two organizations are working together. Um, and I think within the CPBA, there's definitely 
um, some excitement about that as well. So should be good for everyone. Great. Um, uh, does the DEI committee have anything else I'd like to add as just a general update? No, we do not. Okay, thanks, Shalise. Education? In the interest of brevity, um, I will just mention that um, Amanda kind of led the last meeting in terms of the focus, which was on the survey questions that had to do with education from the CPUN survey done last year. So Amanda, do you wanna say something about that? And also before, um, we're trying to get Michelle Quattlebaum to speak with our committee. So we'll keep you posted on that. Oh, great. Hi. I'm trying to get her to join our May forum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we then we'll have a little chat about that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, so I'll just quickly go through the four questions that were on the um, education or that they were on the topic of education in the in the um, CPUN survey. Well, starting with a general question that Mark has already presented to the uh, uh, to the board, elementary schools were the were the um, second to um, highest rated amenity in the community um, with uh, with parks being the highest. So there's a lot of satisfaction with elementary schools uh, in the community uh, and middle and high schools were just a hair lower. So on a scale of one to 10 elementary schools were at an 8.5, high school and middle schools were at a 7.3 and 7.2 respectively. Uh, and then some of the uh, topic specific questions that we asked uh, about uh, about schools were related to the uh, enrollment zone and there still seems to be strong support across the community for uh, having the enrollment zone at the ele elementary school level. Uh, we asked if when capacity allows there should be uh, prioritization uh, based on the sightedness of I-70 where a person lives uh, and so the community there is evidence that the community would be amenable to adding um, a sightedness of I-70 uh, in terms of uh, 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 priority for for seats in a, in a school. And then uh, we asked about intention for going to Northfield just to get a sense of the pipeline uh, among families that have students in, um, in grades below eighth and uh, we're currently seeing 58% declaring that they are likely to send a family member to Northfield. Uh, but um, we've noticed that that's much, much higher uh, north of I-70 where homes tend to be newer and families tend to be younger. So what that could be indicative of is a, um, a pattern over time where uh, we exceed the 60% choice in that DPS uh, has made in their projections for capacity at Northfield High School. Okay, and that that is the education specific information that we gathered from the community in the fall. And will you uh, relay that to the district in some fa fashion? You know, we have a board member who's hard to get a hold of, um, but as soon as I can do that, I will relay it to her. And yes, we will also send it to the district. We've been trying for over a month to, um, to have a meeting with our board member and it's been unsuccessful. If you do get a hold of this person, will you also raise the uh, issue of the May 17th forum? Um, I'm going to keep trying to, and if uh, I get a hold of her, I will, uh, uh, mention your committee meeting yeah we right. we had one exchange with a scheduling person so i'll just leap you into right. that and then we can just keep replying to that thread and see okay. what happens thanks mm -hmm. uh health and safety yeah we're gonna touch on uh our work in a little bit so i will uh say further comments for our conversation about uac uh when we get to it okay sounds good uh safe streets <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, just two quick updates. Um, we had a great uh, uh, meeting um, early, early this month in March uh, with um, a professional from DOTI around the complete streets guidelines, which governs new street construction and what kind of safety features they will have in the future. Um, other sort of main update is, uh, unfortunately, um, the Central Park protected bike lane has been delayed uh, roughly a month. Um, do some issues with the weather and, and laying down the striping for the bike lane. So uh, we're now tentatively, hopefully looking at May 21st um, as the date for a bike lane celebration. Um, if anybody has any feedback on that date, <clears throat> um, let me know. 
Um, I think it was, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, satisfy a bunch of different um, groups that might have conflicts, but if anybody in the community has any reasons why it should not be that, that's a Saturday, um, let me know. And one further thing I wanted to add, um, when Amanda was talking about the CPUN survey and the high rating that elementary schools had, um, traffic within the community was rated lowest. Uh, on that survey um, out of 11 different points, 11 different questions. So we have to keep that in mind and that's sort of always with us when we are planning our Safe Streets Committee meetings and actions. And, and by lowest, you mean sort of least was, desirable? It, least, at least good. <laughs> <laughs> least good, okay. Yeah, it was something like five point, the satisfaction was 5.1% or there something, but yeah. it was at the bottom. Was that date May 8th? No, May 21st. Oh, okay. The community forum, by the way, the annual forum will be the 17th. So just a few days before that. So we can give it a little plug, Brad, and hope Great. We get more of a turnout. Did you say um, May 21st? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, did you say May 21st is going to be the celebration for the, the bike lane? Uh, yeah, that's the tentative date right now. We're kind of circulating that new date just to make sure it works for most folks in the community. Okay. Well, that may be a good thing or that may not be a good thing because that is the weekend for the orange bag project. So I'm still putting the pieces together, which is why I haven't said anything to the board yet. Okay. Okay. So it might be a good thing. It might increase the traffic for the orange bag project or it might derail um, traffic around Founders Green. So we'll see what happens. Oh, it, would, um, it wouldn't go near um, Founders Green. It, the plan is to go from Bill Roberts to the Greenway. Um, and then people can sort of loop back to the school if they need to after the event to, you know, get their bike or, you know, get in their car or whatever, but um, shouldn't, shouldn't go near the Founders Green. Okay. So no problem then. Yeah. All right, finally, the sustainability committee. I'll, uh, I'll just keep talking. Um, so go. we had a great uh, <clears throat> meeting um, uh, last week uh, with um, Joel Rosenberg from Electrify America, um, where he talked about all the ways um, uh, us neighbors can electrify our homes. So basically get rid of natural gas burning appliances, um, both for fighting climate change and also saving on your energy bills. Um, he left behind a really detailed um, deck um, um, and full of great sort of Colorado and Denver specific information. So we're going to be pushing that back out to our sustainability email list and then probably going to host a follow on meeting in April with um, we had some local businesses that help um, households electrify um, all their appliances and, and might do a follow on meeting around helping people actually take that step towards um, putting some of that stuff into practice inside their home. So, so stay tuned on that. That's great. And I'll just put a little plug for the website. Don't forget that that's available to all the committees to post those kinds of resources as well. That's perfect uh, for that kind of thing. Any other uh, committee updates? If not, why don't we move on to the unhoused uh, action uh, Coalition. Uh, I just want to open by apologizing again that this was uh, bumped from last month's uh, agenda and not given its proper due. And so I one wanted to make sure that this was put at the top of this month's agenda. Um, Carol, um, is there anything that you want to start maybe by saying, uh, or is this sort of a safety committee uh, topic more generally? I don't think anybody's coordinated this. Um, yeah. I'm just going to say that I think it's, I really appreciate all the resources that people have put forth, um, whether they're videos or newspaper articles, any number of things that we have received. And I appreciate that very much. Um, I've contacted the Colorado uh, Village, excuse me, collaborative and gotten a little more information. I'm going to go to one of the sites to see um, one of the SOS sites to see uh, exactly what's going on. I just always like to educate myself as much as I can. And I am, I'm just very curious as to what board members essential sort of what they think the essential ask is of uh, UAC. And I'm very interested in knowing people's specific concerns. And, um, and I just will let the committee 
the board um, speak to this as they see fit. Yeah, Carol, thank you. And for the rest of you, thank you for that. Uh, the health and safety after uh, Travis's presentation back in January, the board did direct the health and uh, safety committee to uh, do some additional uh, conversations, uh, do some additional research, and then return to the board uh, with a recommendation. The recommendation, I will say, uh, is not uh, is not concrete. It is it is we believe in principle that the UAC is a good idea. We like the 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 concept behind it. We like the the uh, work that it is being done. But our concerns continue to surface around how we will implement and what impact the UAC might have on our specific neighborhood. And I'll um, start by thanking uh, the great work of uh, Jeff Barron, Carol, Sandra, Liz, and then Shalise, who have all been uh, great uh, collaborators as we've had these conversations. I think first and foremost, we are presented with uh, a coalition of other RNOs throughout the city that have put together a number of policy recommendations. And what we as a committee uh, have a question about is, is it our role as, as uh, CPUN to be telling the city, hey, this is policy we think you should implement. The other question that we have is what will be the impact of our recommendation regarding policy? Is there a potential that it will alienate some of our members? some of our residents and how will the community perceive our actions in potential policy stances. That is what our conversations have focused on. We also talked a lot about education, a lot about uh, sharing information, and, and then we've gotten into the weeds on a couple of things because uh, Liz is just the awesome person that she is and has a, a breadth of knowledge to share with us all. So that is where the committee stands uh, presently. And I think the questions that we have to answer first and foremost is, do we, CPUN, as an organization, feel that it is our place to, to express a specific policy to the city as would be uh, the event in joining the UAC uh, coalition or um, what we believe our role is? And so, Jeff, I will turn back to you. Okay. Um, uh, I'll just open the floor, I suppose, to, to start. Does anyone have anything they're um, keen to express or respond to in Carol or Jack's comments? Um, this is Liz. I just wanted to, if folks um, have not yet done so, I, I recommend um, watching or listening to the recording of the last health and safety meeting because what Jack sent around because I I think it I it kind of was a it was a um, pretty full and comprehensive conversation and I feel like it it might also be kind of like in the eye of the beholder I felt like the takeaway from that was that we were making a commitment as a board to kind of educate ourselves around these issues in order to better evaluate um, what next steps should be, but also open up the conversation to the community. So that was what was in the community update, update email that Mark sent out yesterday was kind of, you know, kind of opening it up to like our neighbors to let them know we're learning about these issues. Here's why, and here are some resources so that you can learn along with us. And that, that was kind of where I had thought like the, the current state of play was after uh, the last meeting um, for health and safety and then also communications. And I will um, agree with Liz 100% with that comment. She um, is just cooler than I am and said that better than I could. So thank you, Liz. I wanna ask a question about the statement of, is it our job as an RNO to make recommendations to the city on policies that we think are beneficial. And I thought that that was the main point of an RNO, um, that it's sort of two-way communication. The city tells us what they're planning and we tell the city, well, this is what we like. Um, so I guess I'm a little bit confused as to why we wouldn't have a role in telling the city about something we think could be beneficial, especially when we're hearing comments month after month after month about, too much trash and unsanctioned camping. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just give my um, uh, thoughts on that, uh, Jamie. I do think Sipan has um, every right to weigh in or to advocate for uh, particular actions or policy within within the community. I think it's more a matter of the how. Um, I think what our responsibility is, is to um, not speak on behalf of the community without having engaged the community on the subject first to, to um, Liz's point about committing to educating ourselves and to um, helping create opportunities to engage the community so that we can we can hear what the feedback is so that we know what the particular areas of the emphasis in those uh, advocacy choices um, should be. I think um, the other acts at element of this is the way in which we choose to go about it. I think I've been pretty clear about my hesitations, not around what uh, the UAC is trying to accomplish or, um, uh, or that there's good sense in the policy recommendations that they're, that they're making, but rather that the tact that they're taking is not consistent necessarily, in my view, with um, how CPUN operates and where I've seen CPUN be successful, which is to say that it, it um, can be uh, confrontational, um, a, not collaborative. Um, I think CPUN has been successful when we're doing, when we're advocating in a way that brings, that widens the circle, brings more people in, doesn't use we call on or call out language. Um, I, I see that as counter to our um, mission and our ethos. That is not to say, though, again, that we don't have a, a role to play or a responsibility even to advocate for what we feel is in the best interest of the, of the community. And, and, and it's really important to me that there were kind of two camps in the, on this email thread that we all had that kind of, that I think I, I relatively fairly represented what, what, the, what the dividing line was there. Um, in my mind, we're not that far apart, the, those two camps. This is, this is a matter of us doing our diligence and, and going about it methodically. Um, to get to a place where I think we all want to get, which is a place where we're making an impact on this particular topic. I hope that wasn't too much of a speech. Jeff, I would agree with you. I think, I think that you're pretty spot on with your comments. And I think a lot of my concern is, yes, it would be good to do something. I've seen a lot of great and good um, ideas and proposals um, end up taking, taking a community, however it's described backwards, because um, the community didn't fully understand it and that can make it more laborious. Um, but it also uh, in the long run can really make a difference in a positive way. Um, Jack or, or anybody else in the committee, was someone running point on maybe trying to coordinate a, a tour of one of the SOS um, sites for like the, for us or, or just for members of our neighborhood? I don't think anybody had taken that task on. Um, okay. That particular subject is where we uh, feared the most uh, controversy. Uh, and and was where we were treading uh, the most carefully. Uh, there is, um, we we were worried that if we went to the community and said we're considering open up, opening, uh, working with the city to create a safe outdoor space, that that would be the end of the conversation and we would have a riot on our hands. Um, not that that is what, I mean that that was our fear, and so we we hadn't progressed farther than that. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, and totally understand that. I think if we're helping to engage the community just to understand some of the things in this uh, ask, I, I would just wholeheartedly recommend, uh, again, not for the purpose of citing one of these in Central Park, but just to have people better grasp what they do and, and why it's part of a potential solution. I, I went on that tour, um, I think it's about almost a year ago, um, and found it just really uh, 
good to see it close up. It, it cleared up a lot of misconceptions I had. And, and also you kind of get to learn a little bit more about the operations of it and, and the, the fiscal, um, I guess, discipline of it compared to other solutions. Anyway, yeah, I, I just wanted to throw that out there that if there's one way we're trying to engage the community just to understand what this is, not that it's, it's, it's gonna be coming to our neighborhood soon, but just understanding that solution. Um, I do think it would be interesting for folks to go see it. Mark, I see your hand raised there. Yeah, um, I wanted to, to follow on with what um, Brad was saying, because I do feel like the information the committee has provided about the safe outdoor spaces has definitely made me feel like that is a preferable option to sort of what we see in our parks and whatnot out elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's there's some progress there. Now, the UAC you know, policy document had like 10 other things beyond that. Um, I don't know about the efficacy of, you know, a whatever it was unhoused population czar or something like that. And, and I, before signing on to a document with like 10 or 11 policy proposals, I would want to make sure it, it's hard to do that when we don't know where like the effectiveness of all those and where the community is on all those. So um, I would use it as an example for where my support usually comes uh, on these things of when we were having a discussion with DPS, I don't know what it was like eight, 10 years ago, something like that on whether or not we should, what, what kind of enrollment zones and whatnot we should have. Um, the threshold I usually go with and, and my understanding of what makes the most sense for an RNO is to be able to demonstrate that you have something around 70% support in the community, which I consider that to be a clear consensus. And that was a threshold that I sort of, you know, laid out for the <clears throat> committee that we had created back then of, you know, we're going to do a survey and, and if the policy has that level of support, then we'll advocate for it. Otherwise, it's more of an informative role. Um, yes, most RNOs do, are more activist than that, but I think most of the time when those RNOs are more activist than that and advocate for things with minority support or slim majority support, they lose support from their community and they don't have as much clout. Um, and the community kind of second guesses, I would say, from what I've seen, some of the information they provide out there. So I, I, I like that we've been unique in our approach in only advocating uh, explicitly for policies when we you know, feel confident there's um, consensus support out there of 70% or higher level. So um, I think we're, we're heading in the right direction, but it might be slow to get the community there because, you know, that's a, a lot of communicating we need to do. But like I said, I feel like we're off to a good start in terms of getting information out there about like these self, safe outdoor spaces are, uh, I would say, better than, you know, leaving people to otherwise be in our parks and otherwise in other places where, like you said, trash accumulates and other issues, you know, fester. Um, and maybe this is a, a, you know, I think if we present it as this is a way, if we focus specifically on one or two or three policies, it might be easier to get broad community support. Um, if we have 11 different policies we're trying to get a coalition behind, I think that's, that's harder to do in community building. So let me jump in here. Um, I appreciate Mark that 70% um, comment that you made. I, I like to bring the attention back to the rename efforts that we underwent. And we definitely had a lot of uh, pushback uh, during that time um, for, you know, along the entire journey. But we came together and decided that that was something important that we would do and we moved forward and spearheaded that initiative and now we uh, have a neighborhood called Central Park and so I think that this situation that we're facing with people experiencing homelessness is definitely something that brings concern to all of us and some of us are concerned for different reasons but um, I I see that the UAC is actually doing something active about it. Um, I'm not sure of all their policies and whether or not I agree with all their policies. Um, but just like, you know, when I joined CPUN, I didn't necessarily agree with everybody at the table. 
um, on the board, but I felt like if, if it was something that, if there were decisions that needed to be made or that were being made, I felt like it would be an opportunity for me to have a voice at the table. And so I think that since they are doing the work, I think that it would be a good idea for the board of CPUN to uh, at least participate. And, you know, maybe we can interject some of the concerns um, that our, our neighborhood would have. And rather than just, you know, sit on the sidelines and uh, watch something happen. So, um, you know, we spoke about it quite a bit in the DEI committee. And we just want to make sure that we are being equitable um, and inclusive. And so sometimes it makes people uncomfortable because they don't want to deal with these, these sorts of issues. But um, I, I don't want to ignore it. And I know that we're not necessarily ignoring it. But this has been brought to us. And I think that it might be a good opportunity for us to uh, participate. Man, I just want to correct yes. something before oh. before we move on from this. I'm sorry. I just want to be sure to correct something that Mandel just said that we, uh, in the name change process, saw a need and acted on it despite not having community consensus. Everything that we did in the name change process was by the book um, in that we evaluated the preference for an alternative name. Uh, when we went and took the vote for that to happen, we did it with the um, consensus needed. Um, by That's our not what I said. I, I was specifically uh, speaking to the 70% that Mark was talking about. 70% support. Right. Yeah, and I think, we, I think Amanda's saying we had that. that. We, had, we had that when we adopted we, the new community name. Right, we had like a 90 something percent vote in the end of changing the name. Oh, I'm talking about the process for bringing that forward, not at the very end. Right. And I don't think anybody opposes being involved in a process or engaging with the UAC, but I think we were specifically asked to support their 11 item policy proposal. And I think an 11 item policy proposal is hard to build community support around because it's uh, 11 items that, you know, aren't necessarily provable that they're effective or that they're necessarily, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a, a lot to, to bite off when it's a, that many items. And I don't know if it's 11, if, my apologies if it's nine and not 11 and I'm, you know, exaggerating or something. I thought it's it was somewhere in that range. Okay, it's 10, sorry, I was off by one. Um, so, but again, like if there's two or three that they think are the most important, you know, I think that that'd be great. Like, for example, I thought it was great that Mercy Housing is converting the you know, the old strip club into uh, an affordable housing place. And I wish they would, I hope that somebody will do the same for the uh, old uh, building that the city also bought and condemned and is doing nothing with that's on Colorado Boulevard between Colfax and 17th. Um, I, I was I was hoping for a long time that they would do exactly this with it. And I'm thrilled that Mercy Housing is doing what they're doing. Um, so I would, you know, I would imagine we can get some community support for something like, you know, turning in those old condemned buildings into, uh, you know, um, affordable housing complexes rather than just leading, leaving them to sit empty like that those ones were would be a policy that we probably could get good broad community support for. And if we want to focus on the safe outdoor uh, spaces, you know, I think that's um, an achievable potential aim, but I don't think we should come out as a board and say, yes, we nominate these three locations in our neighborhood for safe outdoor spaces without having a dialogue about those, you know, things. I don't think we should do that as a board. An allegory. And nobody suggested that. So. Well, but an allegory would be like of the spaces in the community, which like if we were to go to the community and say, which of the following spaces do you think would be most amenable to a safe outdoor space? And that's the approach that we took with the name change. But, um, this is Shalisa. I have a question. Maybe I think maybe I'm missing something, but I it wasn't to my understanding that they were asking us to suggest safe outdoor spaces. They were just asking us to support their initiative, to support um, what it is that they're trying to do with getting the city to find safe outdoor spaces. So did they come back and say that we, we should suggest places within our neighborhoods or is that no, just- No, 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 okay. they did not. No. Okay, okay. 
think okay. I think the specific yeah. policy that they, they are looking, their policy calls for the creation of a safe outdoor space in every council district. Um, I think that's that's the specific policy that uh, oh. we're referencing. Right, Just but Green Valley Ranch and Bell are also included in our council district, right? No. No. No, uh, okay. Parkville is. Just Parkville. Well, it, it depends on which map you go with, the new one or the old one, too. And oh, which okay, one passes. Well, on the old one, who's in our council district? That'd be Park Hill. Okay, so Can Park I Hill already has one, right? Sorry. I also just want to clarify something that Jack was saying. It's not just the citing um, SOSs in council districts. It's actually that the city that the city provide city-owned property for it because the hardest part of one of the hardest pieces of um, the Siting and or finding a location for an SOS place is um, finding the land that's suitable um, and with willing property owners, um, and so that's that's why it's a specific act, ask of the city to do that, um, so that so that it's you know kind of going that it's publicly owned resources being put toward the effort. Um, so it's kind of like a slightly different from just saying. Um, having an SOS in every council district. It's it's looking at city resources that can be put toward the effort. Um, so I, I just wanted to, I, I suppose it's kind of like a dotting an I and crossing a T, but I, I just wanted to make sure that's kind of not lost in why it's included there. Yeah, I'm a little uh, confused about what is what is so appealing about the UAC specifically. And Mandel, Mandel you've and uh, sort of framed it, um, and correct me if you know, if you feel like this is unfair, as like signing on or sort of sitting on the sidelines. I think what this board has made clear from all all perspectives is, is that sitting on the sidelines isn't an option. Um, what what is what is what is the UAC specifically offering that is advantageous for us to? Um, uh, affiliate with what I heard. What I heard Travis say, for example, is that a lot of people, a lot of these organizations, a lot of this network of RNOs, um, really just signed on, and then that was the end of their participation in the in in the effort, uh, at least to date. If if I can speak a little bit to that question, Jeff, um, mm -hmm. it, part of it is because there are, I think, it's because it represents an alternative to the status quo. Um, and and that it's it's RN so RNOs speaking kind of with a unified unified voice are listened to in some ways um, more than the service providers who directly work on these things. Um, so that the city the, the city agencies feel that they have the kind of support of um, residents when they proceed with these policies. So you can have these policies laid out in the city's plans, but given limited budgets, limited time, limited resources, um, when, you know, when decisions are being made about where, where efforts will go, it actually does go a long way to have RNO support um, of some of those policies. And there are RNOs who are proposing other <laughs> solutions, and largely it's around kind of um, increasing law enforcement resources that kind of get rid of the aesthetics of the problem without addressing root causes. Um, and obviously, you know, I, I come from a very specific perspective on this um, through the work that I do, but I, I want to make sure that I share that perspective because I see, I, I do see kind of sometimes how the sausage is made. Um, and so I understand, I understand what UAC is doing as, um, as, as kind of um, uh, basically uh, unified citizen lobbying um, around it. And that, that kind of going right now, the, the kind of mechanism that the city has for uh, kind of public engagement and communicating with neighborhoods is through the, the RNO ordinance. Um, and so a bunch of RNOs kind of banding together to kind of, and they, they actually are working pretty collaboratively, I think, um, with each other. And I can speak to some of that later, um, but, but just um, that, that it, is, it is a mechanism for communicating with the city that just kind of all of us separately don't have that 
kind of collective voice. So I just kind of offering that perspective to kind of explain and contextualize why UAC is kind of unique in this space. Um, I, so I realize I missed some meetings um, and I apologize for that. So I'm a little bit um, out of the loop, but it, it sounds like it would be really good to have some sort of representative from UAC talk to the whole community at one of these monthly meetings so that the board and also people in the community could say, okay, why this policy? Why did you put this policy forward? Why do you find that valuable? It seems like these RNOs are in neighborhoods that are more centrally located in Denver, which means that they're facing this issue of the unhoused more directly than we are. And so they have thought about it more than we have. And that means they probably have more experience and more uh, thought processes about it. And I think it's silly for us to spin our wheels when we don't know what they've learned. So we should first learn from them. And I know you guys, I think, talked to someone from them, but I mean, if we're gonna bring this to the community, we should have let the community be able to say, uh, we like, this policy, we don't like this policy, you know, why did you decide to do that? Does it make sense? Yeah, Jamie, we had Travis uh, Liker, the, the, who's, who's really led this effort, speak to us in January um, so that we could ask those um, questions specifically. And a lot, I think a lot of the debate or discussion that you're hearing is born specifically out of um, uh, his answers to those, to those uh, very questions. Um, uh, the discussion um, had been, do we let Travis just speak to the community first? Um, uh, and, um, and I'll say I advocated for Travis to speak to the board first because we were being asked to endorse what, um, what UAC was uh, present, proposing. And so I thought it would be prudent for the board to hear um, hear from Travis directly first so that we could uh, debate this very thing before um, something that we were being asked to sign on to uh, went to the community at large. I'll also say it doesn't feel like the UAC, I mean, they have a monthly meeting uh, and, and Carol is, is graciously volunteering to, to attend those. So thank you, Carol. But the impression I got from Travis in some of my questions to him was, yeah, we have a policy uh, we want you to support it, but this is our policy stance. Um, and and no, so, Jack, Jack, I go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Finish what you were going to say. No, that's all right, Carol. No, I, I've had some back and forth with Travis, and I think I reported back to all of you about a follow up conversation that we had a couple of because he asked for feedback and suggestions. And Liz and I made those suggestions and he shared them with his group and with their lawyers. And he said, you know, you said some things that were very um, important and they, I think are very much, well, flexible is not the word, but they're certainly open to people's concerns and questions and sort of reconfiguring things and making things more clear if need be. I don't think that there's, it's, hard, it's a hard and fast document and I also um, made the comment about language that all writing is edited and there were some concerns about word usage, word choice. And I think that's easy enough to communicate and um, to use language that is collaborative if to some people it seems combative. And I also just wanna add, yes, I will attend a UAC meeting, but I also, um, I'm going to come back um, to the person that I was chatting with uh, with an SOS and, and I'm happy to arrange a group meeting. I can, I can see what I need to do in order to make that happen. I, I think what's important is that a decision on whether to uh, join UAC or not doesn't have to be made today or tomorrow or the next day. Um, I think there's a, Travis was a very gracious um, guest, uh, open to conversation as Carol just indicated. Um, 
no reason to think he wouldn't be open to collaboration on this um, in the future. I think it's just a matter of us um, making sure that we know what we're going into such a, uh, a collaboration or partnership hoping to, hoping to achieve first. Um, as, as Liz sort of summarized at the beginning of this discussion, I think we're in the, we need to um, educate ourselves, educate uh, our community, collect feedback phase of this process so that um, when we're, we can, when we decide, we, we're, we can decide every day whether or not to join UAC. Um, but, but that way we have a, um, a set of uh, parameters, goals, objectives, when should the day come that we decide that joining the UAC makes, makes good sense for CPON. Yeah, I think that's fair, Jeff. I, I just wanna say, cause you asked what, what was so, um, why it is that I was interested in UAC. And mm -hmm. I think that what I've seen in the city um, and what was presented, it, it sounded to me like uh, something worthwhile that they're doing. Um, I do understand that, you know, if, if we were to sign on that we would need to be in agreement with what exactly we were signing up for. Um, and I, I think that's, that's just wise. And so if there are, you know, 10 of these um, rules or guidelines or whatever it is that they follow, that if we have objections to specific ones, then we would need to have that addressed um, after we, you know, considered all of it. <clears throat> Thanks, Mandel. I think they are doing something important, and Liz is right that our no voices do matter in these in these policy discussions. Uh, I think the tension here is that um, CPUN takes a more deliberate, um, kind of methodical and yes, slow approach, and there's a tension there um, uh, that we just have to um, reconcile. Um, uh, but but um, what I've seen in my time on the board is that, that that's what makes CPUN different and it's what it's what's made it successful is the willingness to be methodical and deliberate about these sorts of issues. Um, yeah, I, I want to add one point to that, Jeff, because I think you're right. Um, and and, and I, I hate to belabor this point, but, um, you know, I think there's a lot of power in our efforts to educate the community on these issues, particularly considering we're 13 months out from a new city council member and a new mayor. Um, and honestly, I feel like having some credibility of we we didn't pick sides, we just educated the community may have more impact on the direction the city goes than we spoke for the community without asking them and joined a coalition that called for 10 policy proposals. Um, I think we can we can, you know, have a really profound voice of, hey, you should educate yourself about these issues as you approach this next election next year. Um, you know, I, I think that to me, that's a more powerful approach to engaging on these issues, honestly, than saying we spoke on behalf on your behalf in favor of this coalition. Well, but Mark, I would say that exactly what Mandel said, we want to have a voice at the table. So it's not that like we want to be involved with the conversations that are happening and UAC has is engaged, like they're engaged. So let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's figure out what they're doing and be able to discuss with them things that seem beneficial to the complaints that we're hearing in the neighborhood. And I think by sort of taking a stance back in some ways we run the risk of not having a voice in those decisions or not listening so much not being so involved with what they're doing so i would hope that we could figure out a way to be more involved in that aspect and then the other thing is that edu if you want 70 percent of the community along i mean that's a massive educational uh, you know output 
So, I mean, I, I appreciate the emails being sent out, but I mean, how are you at, and engagement is a choice too. Some people choose not to engage. So how are you going to get 70% of the community to say, yeah, we wanna do something about the unhoused and not just the knee jerk of reaction of, I hate the, I hate the camping and I hate the trash, but what can we, how do we engage? How do we make it better? Like how, what's the educational campaign behind that or the information campaign behind that? I can answer that question, but not in the negative two minutes that we have. So I'm happy to, to answer that question over burrito someday, if that works for you. But, um, but yeah, I think we should, uh, I, I agree. I mean, I understand. I think it's a major out, out or effort, but I think it's warranted on an important issue like this. Yeah, I, I am looking at the at the time here. We do have other stuff to get to. Obviously, we will not get to the full agenda, but I do appreciate uh, the discussion. I hope everyone recognizes what I see as, as good faith on all perspectives here in trying to arrive at, a, at an approach that, um, that, that takes on this issue in a way that's consistent with what our responsibilities as an RNL are. Um, let's keep it, keep it going. Um, okay. Uh, I think this might just have to be the last thing. I will send out an email tomorrow, um, with key information for the remaining topics, uh, that we had scheduled. Um, but I do want to take this vote on the cap meeting. I had the pleasure of joining, uh, what was the unofficial final cab, uh, meeting. Uh, I think they're looking at um, uh, officially winding down their organization pending um, our vote tonight and pending a, a, a vote of the, or at least a, uh, an agreement among the SDC board um, to agree for CPUN to take over the uh, responsibilities of the Citizens Advisory Board. Um, uh, they had a lot of, um, pride in their work, I, I must say, and it's pride that was uh, well-earned and deserved. And I'm glad they had uh, an opportunity to kind of reflect uh, on, on all they've done for, for the neighborhood in um, being champions of and defenders of the Green Book. Um, uh, I, thought, I, I thought it was quite touching actually to, to hear their, um, how, how much it meant to them to be a part of this board and, and um, the uh, unanimous support that I heard on the call for CPUN um, taking the baton uh, from here. Um, I think, and this, this speaks to the issue we just had, which was, um, uh, again, they were unan unanimous in their support, um, but they did say um, they worry about whether CPUN's going to take on a big bully. Um, uh, if there's some developer that comes in, is CPUN going to uh, it, be that defender and champion of the Green Book? And I think it's, it's just worth, um, I think there's broad consensus amongst this board um, that, uh, that us taking over the CAB's limited responsibilities um, it, it is something that we want to do. Um, but it's worth just knowing that um, that defending the Green Book and, and uh, being champions of the Green Book and letting the Green Book drive um, their, their perspective uh, is important to them and, and a big part of um, what they hope to see out of, out of uh, CPUN as well. Any thoughts or comments on that? Jeff, I'll, I'll get the big developer. You just let me at him, I'll, I'll take the <laughs> one. What I guess was that? What, ahead, sorry, Amanda. Mark. The, where would that developer be building something, given that the community is almost done? I'm like, I, okay, I we know. can take them on, but like, how hypothetical is this question? I think I think it's a, like a wrecking ball. No, no, I think it's a spirit thing. It's it's uh, they they um, they want to see they want to know that the the neighborhood in the you know 0.3 percent or whatever it is that's left to be developed. Uh, will be will be looked after with the same sort of care. Um, I, I felt it only um, appropriate to, or only fair to acknowledge their 
uh, their wishes uh, here before we before we take this vote. The the reality is that there's very little uh, work here left to do. That's why we're being asked to see it through. Um, uh, all of the existing CAD members have been um, more than willing to support us uh, in terms of the transition, as has the SDC. They're willing to sit down and walk through logistics of it with us. We would be entitled to the uh, non-voting uh, seat on the SDC board, um, mm -hmm. as well as uh, on their uh, design review committee. Um, so uh, that would be the, the really tangible thing here are those two seats. Um, and then uh, uh, again, um, it would really be a pretty minor role. They'd meet, meet quarterly at this point. This is not a significant commitment on the part of uh, uh, our board members at this point. We, is, SDC okay. also, is SDC also willing to provide staff support should we need it? or no the conversation okay no there is no staff um, yeah thank you for uh reminding me of that question jack there is no staff support um to be had here um uh i don't suspect though uh from my conversations with tammy from the stc or with uh lucia or jim from cat that that's that, that's necessary at this point any other comments before i uh, propose a vote Jeff, I just want to make sure. Uh, I mean, I know I don't get a vote, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> no, <go ahead. laughs> um, so the, the CAB, um, that's the committee that put together the Green Book, and they want CPRIN to take over their operations to oversee the last 3% of the community build out. That, that's right, uh, Shalise. But they they want to wind down their organization. They're having a hard time getting uh, CAB members to turn up for board meetings, that kind of thing. Uh, just because there's so little left left to do. Okay, so if CPLAN takes over the committee that was responsible for creating the Green Book, but doesn't feel comfortable signing on with UAC, um, isn't that kind of going against what CAB stands for? Well, did CAB, C CAB didn't really, like create the Green Book, that was their guiding um, document in, in their development decisions. Do I have that history correct? I think, I, isn't it the design principles for, you know, the like the neighborhood and how both residential and commercial is supposed to be constructed, like things like the buildings should face like inward, you know, in a commercial area versus like out towards the road and things. I think that's, okay. that's what the green book is, is like yeah. those kind of design over, and that's probably the wrong terminology, but kind of like the design principles around how construction is supposed to be oriented in the community. Okay. So I, I'm thinking of the neighborhood green book that talks about this being an urban oasis that's inclusive and. Shalise, that's the, Shalise, that's the <laughs> same thing. Um, okay. There, okay. there are two ports of it. And okay. I would be happy to give you my green book. Uh, it's sitting no, no, on my I have, desk. I, have it. I was just like, wait, what? Uh, okay. I just want to make sure that okay. it's, hopefully that was among the things Kevin gave you, but we're happy to give you a copy of the green book. Yeah, it, no, no, no. I just want to make sure we kept saying green book, green book. And when I think of the green book, I think of the inclusiveness and trying to bring all the neighborhoods together and not necessarily the design and build out of it. So, okay. Thank you. But and I, I think it's the same a fair question though, Shalise, about you know the difference between the, the two. Um, I would say the difference between not signing on to the UAC and signing on to this is we're not guaranteeing in any respect that we will use that as our core guiding principles. I think we would still be bound by our mission. I just think that our mission would and the community's core values would probably align well where it wouldn't be in conflict. Um, I don't know for certain that our mission would align as well with uh, endorsing 10 specific policy proposals that the community is unaware of, I guess is the way I'd put it. Okay. Yeah, That's I, I just go a little further and just say that again, it, um, the UAC isn't the only vehicle for expressing the values of the community. There's lots of ways that we can go about that. Um, I don't see it as uh, hypocritical to um, to adhere to the Green Book and to not sign up for the UAC at this point. Okay, I, I, I may be um, a little sensitive to 
the diversity of the neighborhood, I just finished reading a, rest, a Westwood article. And I feel like every time Westwood talks about Central Park, they talk about our lack of diversity and our privilege. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they hate us. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. They, they, I, I have the same experience, at least. <laughs> right. Right. I, I probably should wait until tomorrow to read that. So, okay. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Um, why, don't I, why don't we put it to the vote? Well, is someone should I'll just say uh, uh, I propose that we um, that Central Park United Neighbors take over the remaining responsibilities of CAB. Does anyone? Jeff, say? I Jeff, I think that's a motion that you're trying. Motion, to make. forgive me. Thank you, Jack. And I, if that I is, the, I will make a motion to have uh, Central Park United United Neighbors assume the duties of the Citizens Advisory Board. I will second your motion. Uh, does anyone object? I'll just ask it that way. And again, if I want to pull up my Robert's Rules book, we're going to vote by reverse roll call and look. No, for we're it. we're doing Senate rules of asking unanimous consent so that we don't have to have a vote. So. Oh, even better. Yeah. Okay. I we believe we have it. Ten board members are present, so that's sufficient for quorum. Yeah, we have quorum. We got a super quorum. Yeah. Um, okay, it passes. I will relay that to um, uh, to, to the uh, cat board. Um, apologies, everyone. Thank you for spending a few extra minutes with us. Um, I will I will summarize these changes. Just one quick request. Uh, of the DEI committee. Um, we wanted to put the uh, survey results of those key findings in the front porch um, and our deadline is Friday. I wondered if I might um, provide a framework uh, that you all could drop some, some select content from your present tonight, presentation tonight into so that we could uh, include that in the uh, front porch for April. Is that of interest? Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Mark did this for the general survey uh, last month, so we've got a good model for, for space and that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the time. Again, I will summarize uh, the remaining uh, agenda items in the email. Right, thank you. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Can I talk to Carol for just two minutes? Can we have host privileges and the um and 